Okay. So, Much Hashem, we have the schut to be together tonight. And again, I'm going to tell you this a million times, but you may not appreciate it until you're 60 years old. These are the best moments of your life. There is nothing better in the world than to be with your friends, with your brothers, with your family, learning the truth of truths from the Tzadik Yisrael Olam. And you will understand that either soon or later. There is nothing more special than a group of brothers coming together, searching for the truth. Mamj, it's the greatest thing in the world. And this is the reason why the trip to Uman for me last year was life-changing. Because I thought that there's a few people who do stuff like that. And I always felt like an alien. And all of a sudden, I went to a small shtetl in Ukraine, and I saw 100,000 people, just like us, all searching for the truth. And there was no pretentiousness, and there was no fakeness, and you didn't know who the rabbis were, and you didn't know who the students were, because it didn't make a difference. Everyone was just looking for the truth, doing it together, with singing, with fire, with, with conversation, real conversations. You sit down with this rabbi, you ask him this question, you don't even know he's the rabbi who wrote this book that you've been reading for the past five years. He's just talking to you, hey, I'm from New Jersey, you know, and this and that. Talk to this guy, and it's the same thing. And then you see Gedalia, and you talk to him, and like you ask him questions. Hey, uh, we're hanging out in the mikvah. Why? Because the whole concept of Bresa Hasidus is stop being fake. Because the whole problem and the whole reason that the whole world is disconnected from Hashem is because of pretentiousness, because of a facade, because of ego. Rabbi Nachman stripped his students of their ego. And anyone who learns Rabbi Nachman's Torah for the right reasons, he is going to come away and his ego is going to be shattered, but in the greatest way possible. Not because Rabbi Nachman's coming down on him, not because he's saying negative things about him, but because he teaches them. You want to know something amazing? You could be connected to the Ein Sof. You could be connected to the infinite light of Hashem. You know there's one thing that's stopping you, yourself. I always give this example. What is the most fun experience that a person has in the secular world? I hold it's to go to a concert or a festival. You go to a concert or a festival, you have thousands of people singing. Nobody there is saying, how can I make more money? Nobody there is saying, look at me. Nobody cares there. Why? Because everybody's ego is being nullified by being part of a collective whole that's connecting in something. Now imagine you did that for Hashem. Imagine you did that with Torah. Imagine you did that for the realest, genuest, most, most life-giving thing, what that would be like. And nobody there is upset that it's not about them. Because when a person connects to something that real, he's very happy to let his ego melt away and just to be part of the experience. Hashem says, Anochi Hashem Elokecha. I am Hashem, your God. Asher Tetich Me'eret Mitzrayim. I took you from the land of Mitzrayim, Mi Beit Avadim, from the house of slavery, of servitude. Kishadam Yodei Shekol Me'otav, Heim Latovato. When man knows that every single thing that happens to him is for his good. Zot bechinati me'ein olam haba. You're tasting a taste of olam haba. When a person knows that when he won his basketball game, that was from Hashem. And when that girl broke up with him, it was from Hashem. And when he got that great grade on his test, it was from Hashem. And when chas v'shalom, his parents abused him, it was from Hashem. When he came to Ornatan to learn Rabbi Nachman's Torah and he traversed through many train stations and he had Mesir Nefesh to get here from Brooklyn, it's from Hashem. 
And when his friends say, why are you being so extreme? That you're going to go learn the Kutumaran, Rabbi Nachman's Torah. Why don't you just be normal and go learn something that everybody understands and everybody learns. And it's also from Hashem. And when a person knows that every single thing that happens to him is from Hashem, you are literally tasting what it's going to be like in Olmaba. Kemosh Where do we know this from? David HaMelech. That David, the Mashiach, says, Ba'ashem ahalel davar. When it's Yudke Vavke, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to say thank you for this thing that's happening to me. Be'elokim ahalel davar. And when it's Elokim, I'm also going to praise you the same exact way. What's the difference? We know that Chazal, the sages, teach that whenever the Torah says Yudke Vavke, it means that Hashem is revealing His love to you. And that when a, the Torah says Elohim, it's talking about judgment, it's talking about din, it's talking about, so to speak, a concealment of Himself. Yudke Vavke is a revelation of Hashem as He really is. Elohim is a concealment of Hashem as He really is. Justice. Din. And what does David Melech, the soul of Mashiach, say? He says, you know, I don't know what I figured out. That Hashem and His name are one. That Hashem and Elohim are one. It was one thing. That when the good things happen to me, that's from Yudke Vavke, it's from Hashem, I'm going to say thank you. And when it's not at all like I want it to go, and this is the most painful, hurtful experience that a person can go through, and it's from Elohim, I'm going to thank Him the same. Why? Because I know, after nullifying my ego, that it's really all one God. There is no separation between the two. What happened in Christianity? There was no way for them to figure out how could it be that things happen in this world that are not pleasant from God. It's only good. So what are you really saying now? Good according to you. Who says that's really good? So because they don't understand how it could be something can happen to a person that on paper doesn't look good, it must come from Satan. Why? Because they don't understand how it could be that Hashem could do anything bad, and they're right. He can't. He can only do good. But who says that His good is the good that you think it is? What is a Jewish neshama capable of understanding? That everything is for the good. Because Hashem is the one who's causing everything to happen. But how does a person be able to hop that he's able to understand and experience in his heart that the negativity is just as good, the negativity is just as good as the good that we're used to experiencing? The answer is only through bitul of the ego, only through nullification of the ego. Because the whole reason we feel that things are not good is because our ego doesn't like those things. Our sense of self as separate from reality, the part of us that wants to increase self, honor, money, uh, emotional, physical comfort, whatever, all of these things are all related to ego. So what happens when our ego is being threatened? We say this is not good. And if it's not good, so the Christians say it must be coming from Satan. Or maybe Hashem is just trying to allow you to become humble so that you can experience Him. Because very simply, as long as a person is filled with himself, he can't fill himself with anything else. As long as a cup is filled with a drink, you can't pour another drink in there. But David the Melech, that he slaughtered his ego in his lifetime by thanking Hashem for both, then he was able to experience that really it's all good. It's all from Hashem. Honestly, this takes time. Yes, this takes a lot of time. It could take three days, or it could take 40 years. If they followed Moshe Rabbeinu, 
like he told them, we can get to Israel, we can get to complete humility, to complete the Muna, and you follow me, we can get there in three days. But nobody believed him because that's insane. How are you going to tell me I'm going to get a Muna in three days? How are you telling me everything in my life is going to be fixed in three days? That can't be possible. You're just a person. How do you know? We're all Tzadikim. We all know things. And this is not realistic. So what happened? Hashem had them travel for 40 years to get to the land of Israel. In three days. And the commentaries explain how to take 40 years when it could have took three days. Hashem made them go in circles around the land, but in a different way each time, so they never knew that they were circling around the land for 40 years. They were circling around the land. When you say nullifying your ego, okay. When you say nullifying your ego, is that does that mean understanding that everything's from Hashem? That's connected. To the degree that your ego is nullified, to that degree you can understand that everything is from Hashem. How did they know they were going in circles? They didn't know they were going in circles. It took them so little time they didn't realize. They didn't. They didn't know they were going in circles. Hashem concealed from them. This is an amazing thing. I want to tell you. When Hashem wants a person to know something and to figure something out, He does. And when Hashem doesn't want you to know something or figure it out, it could be right in front of your face and you have no idea. So Hashem told them after they were going in circles? Okay. No, He gave them 40 years to figure it out. And then the Midrash brings down that they really were circling for 40 years and they could have got there in a few days. Okay? That's how long it takes to get from Mitzrayim to Eretz Israel. Three days? They, they could have gotten there in a very, very short amount of time. I want to tell you something that the Tanya says in the beginning because it's so epic and it's so gewaldic, it's so gishmak, and it's so... It's the first thing anybody needs to know when they start to learn Rabbi Nachman's Torah. Because the first experience everybody has is, on the one hand, wow, this is fire. And on the other hand, this is going to be really hard work. This is really hard. This isn't like a shiur that I usually go to where they just teach me like nice things and I feel good about myself after and I go home. You're telling me I have to go talk to Hashem for an hour. You're telling me I have to work on nullifying my jealousy and my anger and my hatred and my ego and judging everybody favorably and doing uh, whatever my wife says because she's really just a mirror of me. Oh my gosh, it's so much work. <laughs> oh! So listen to what the Tanya says in the beginning. They said to Moshe Rabbeinu, and Moshe brought down the Torah. And he did the Mishnah Torah. And before he left and he passed away, he said, This thing is not far from you. It's very near to you. So what do the commentaries bring down he's speaking about? To Shuva, to return to Hashem, to go to the land of Israel. Teshuva. You are, everyone was hearing Moshe talk about all the things that the Torah says, and they were like, oh my gosh, how are we going to do all those things? And you're not even going to be here. Moshe said to them, it's so close to you, you don't even understand how near this thing is to you. So what does the Tanya say? Something so, so beautiful. There is a short, long road, and there is a long, short road. Meaning, because I'm really bad with uh, geography, but I'm sure you're right. Meaning, uh, just bad geography, stop. I, I know I want to go to the land of Israel, that's my geography, okay? So, for a person to achieve a Muna Shlema, to achieve complete Muna, which the Torah calls the land of Israel, there is a short, long road there, and there's a long, short road there. Every person, the Tanya says, is trying to take the short, long road. What does that mean? Segulas. <laughs> Segulas. Yeah, it's true. 
Ispandut. Everyone is looking for a bracha that's going to cause them to elevate to the highest spiritual levels. Even if they are the worst parent, they want a bracha that their kid should be good. I remember there was a rabbi, uh, they went to him and he said, please give me a bracha that, I'm, uh, that my kids are going to be. He goes, I'm going to give you the best bracha in the world right now. There is no bracha to make your kids good. If you're a good parent, your kids are going to be good kids. <laughs> That's the bracha I give you. You should learn to be a good parent. That was a bracha. <laughs> it is. It's the greatest bracha in the world. You're right, 100%. It's mamish, the greatest bracha in the world. And everyone who wants to take the short, long road, what does that mean? I want to f- go the shortest way to get to the place, the greatest good, the good life. Quick fix. What's the short way in our context? What's the short way in our context? I don't want to do all of these things that the tzaddikim tell us are going to get us to the land of Israel, that are going to get us to complete the Muna, that are going to get us to the ultimate good, complete the Vekut and connection to Hashem, where all good health, uh, happiness, joy, parnasa, livelihood, a good relationship comes from. Because who wants to work so hard? Shortcuts. Not for money. I'll do anything. Yeah. You got to hustle. You got to do this. this. Oh my God, the rabbi told me I have to do something new. What is this? What type of Torah class is this? We say the land of Israel is physical, not mental. It's both. Everything in the physical world is a reflection of a higher spiritual reality. The land of Israel is a physical projection of a muna shlema, of complete amuna. That complete amuna manifests itself in the physical world as a land called the land of Israel. This is the land that Hashem promised Avraham to give to his descendants. And this is a very deep concept, and we're not going to get into it too much right now. But very simply, we're going to learn in the seventh Torah of the Kutub Moran that the land of Israel is the state of complete amuna. Because that's the, all the good. Okay. <laughs> So, what does he say though? But because everyone wants to take the short, long road, meaning the short road, they end up taking a very long road. Meaning, what they want ends up taking them 40 years to get to the land of Israel. He says, or, we have another choice. The choice that Moshe Rabbeinu gave the Jewish people when he was alive the choice the Baal Shem Tov and his descendants are giving us, that we can take the long, short road. It's a road that appears to be crazy long, very difficult, something that uh, seems above capability of a person to do. And yet, when a person commits himself fully to that long road, it's actually a very short road. Three days. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you? Just come sit over here. Okay. And when a person gets to the place that he's living in the land of Israel, and Hashem and Elohim for him is exactly the same. This is a taste of Olam because what's going to happen in Olam Abba, we know at the end of Elena we say, Bayomahu, 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 Yeshem Echad, Ushemo Echad. That Hashem is one and His name will be one. And the Gemara and the Tzadikim, the Tamidei Chachamim, they have the strongest question in the world. Hikshu, they have a difficulty. Vechia Idna, Lavu Echad, Hashem is not one now. On that day when Mashiach comes, Hashem is going to be one and His name is going to be one. What, He's not one now? And the smartest people who ever lived, they have an answer to this question. That when good things happen to us in this world, we say, The one who is good and who does good. And on the bed, Diana Emet. Baruch Diana Emet. But in Olm Haba, whether it was good or it was bad, there's only going to be one blessing. 
It says in Masechet Pesachim, and that is the one who's good and who does good. So what's the whole difference between this world and that world? The illusion is going to fade away. Because Rabbi Nachman says all suffering comes from a chesron of da'at. Not excess. N so sadness comes from excess. Yeah, very good. But we're gonna, it's a different Torah from a different time. But all suffering, stam yisurim, comes from a chesron of da'at, a lacking of da'at. What's da'at? Da'at means simply, they translate it as knowledge. But in our, for what we can understand, if you could understand this word, it means consciousness. What type of consciousness? Perception. A perception, but it's not just an intellectual perception. It's an experience. If I told you right now that uh, before I came here, I did five cartwheels. So you'd say, I gave you knowledge, you know? I gave you new information. The Torah says that's not knowledge. Knowledge is only called knowledge if it changes your reality. That's called da'at. And, and brings you closer to Hashem. Why? Because the concept of wisdom is that it's not just information. We think wisdom is, I go online and I look up a random news article and I say I got more wisdom. That's the whole point. No, that's the whole point. One second. This whole concept of da'at, being and chokhmah, all of these things, whether it's wisdom, understanding, or knowledge, according to the Torah, what does that mean? Is that any piece of information that I get? No. The only thing that qualifies as wisdom, understanding, and knowledge is, is consciousness that you put into practice and that brings you closer to Hashem. And if you're learning something that's not bringing you closer to Hashem, Rabbi Nachman says, it's not called wisdom at all. It's the same thing you leave in the toilet when you leave your bathroom. Number two. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> I like how we have a running commentary over here. We have the, we have the Rashi and the Ramban and the Tosafot. Number two. Okay. <laughs> it's a live session. <laughs> it's a live session, Mok Hashem. Okay. So any knowledge that you acquire that brings you closer to Hashem, not just in your mind, but that you experience Hashem in a deeper way, in a felt way. Not just that I, I know that there's such a thing as a muna, but when things happen to me, I actually experience shleimut, wholeness. That's called da'at. We learn it from Adam, yada et chava, that the first time the word comes up is that Adam knew chava. So we know that this is the essence of the word da'at, like Rabbi Akiva Tad says. So what does da'at mean? He had intimate relations with his wife. What does that have to do with knowledge? Go, go, go back to what, where you said his name. For that, before you said that rabbi's name, what would you say? Adam yada et chava. Uh -huh. The Adam knew chava. This is the first time the word da'at comes up in the Torah. In Chumash? Yes. Okay. So then the question is, we know that the first time any word comes up according to all the tzaddikim, this is the, the yeah, essence yeah, of the word. The rest of the time Very good. So the first time the word da'at, knowledge, comes up, which we know is the key to Mashiach, because it says in the, in the prophet Yeshaya that da'at is going to cover the world like water covers the sea. So the whole difference between now and then is da'at. So this is a very important word. What's the first time it's used in the essence of the word? Intimate relations between Adam and Chava. What does that have to do with knowledge? And the answer is... The Ramban says that uh, you cling to your wife. Okay, good. What is it? What is being intimate with your life? What is it to have sexual relations with your wife? It is the most intimate experience a human being can have. Hashem wants us to have that level of intimacy with Him. That's called Da'at. That you know Hashem to such an extent that you actually experience Him. It's called Devekut. That now you're one with Him. It's an, it's an experiential knowledge. Like for instance, if I said right now, are you alive? Like Rabbi Kedip Tad says, are you alive? I say, yeah, of course I'm alive. If I ask you to try to prove that, you can't prove that to me. I heard that here. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm telling you. And then he says, how do you prove that you're not sleeping? You can't prove that either. Right. But you just know. 
because it's an experience. He say that. Yes, he does. <laughs> he says, you don't know. Huh? No, 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 but he says, no. You can't know. He no. Says, that's what he said. No, 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 that's not what he ends up saying. He says, you can't intellectually know, but you experientially know, and if not, then you need to go see a therapist. Right? And he's not saying it in a demeaning way. He's saying that you have to know that you exist. You do exist. How do you know? How can you prove that you can't? You just know. So the Torah is teaching, what's the level that we need to get? We need da'at. What's da'at? That you know that everything comes from Hashem. Isn't there a person who thinks they exist? Like no, they can't. Right here. Then therefore what? Physical. Yeah, and when you're in a dream, is that real? No, in the ring. How do you know? Because you know you're in the ring. When you're in a dream, you know you're dreaming, or only when you wake up? No, in the dream, you know you're In every dreaming. single dream, you know you're dreaming? Sometimes. Most of them. Is there dreams where you don't know? So how do you know you're not dreaming right now? Because I'm, I know I'm not. How do you know? Because I could pinch myself. You could do that in your dream also. <laughs> you could do that in your dream also. I always thought that when I saw it, that's when I was How do you know you're not dreaming right now? Because you could pinch yourself. How do you know <laughs> that it's not like the famous <laughs> Chassid Talmud Chacham said, it was all a dream. <laughs> I used to read Chumush and, and Tanakh <laughs> and Mishpacha magazine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's a deacon on my wall. Oh my gosh, this is great. <laughs> We're lifting up the sparks, Mamish. Oh my gosh, his mom is a big Sonic. <laughs> he was definitely big. I don't know about the rest of it. Okay. So, you don't have to think about it. You're right. You're alive. You're awake. But the point is you can't prove it. You just can't. What's it got to do with Da'at? Da'at is an experiential knowledge. To know Hashem doesn't mean that you intellectually understand that God exists. It means that you experience Him on an emotional, physical, psychological, physiological level. That every part of your limb experiences a shem. Biochemical. Biochemical. Historical. Forensic. Supernal. <laughs> Supernal. <laughs> what do you mean by, by intellectual don't understand? Everybody understands that uh, it's about chuvo or that it's uh, that the, the religious, that they know that a shem exists. Even the non-Jewish world, the majority of non-Jews also know God exists. But that's not the knowledge that the Torah is talking about. There's, there's, there's this common thing among people who are in the Sirach. You read the Shem, you know what I'm saying? Meaning, if a, per, yeah, like if a person says, I know what Shabbat is, but I don't keep it, then he doesn't know what Shabbat is. No, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, this is, no, but I'm saying that, I'm not even trying to, I'm saying a deep spiritual thing. Knowledge the, 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 the effect of real knowledge is that it changes your behaviors. It changes your actions. And if the knowledge is not actually changing you, then it's not da. Is that why when you learn something, you learn it 101 times? Yeah. You're internalizing it so it becomes da. Because what it starts at is as chokhmah. When you learn a fire lesson, you're on fire. That's like chokhmah. It's like a thunderbolt, the Tanya says. But then what happens, you have to contemplate it, you have to look it over, you have to think about it, right? So that's Bina. And then Da'at is when it enters your heart. Actions. That it becomes all of your actions because it's now in your heart. It becomes one with knowledge. You're one with that knowledge and now you do it. So now we're saying, you can't say, I know Hashem and I don't do His Ratzon. That means you don't know Him. It's not a, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with it. I mean, it doesn't mean that there's something bad about you. Everything's fine, everything's good, you're a good person. But you can't know the Torah and not keep it. You can't know Shabbat and not keep it. Because if you knew it, you would do it. And if a person says they knew and they don't really do it, it means they don't really know what Shabbat is. They need to go and... and but you can still do Shabbat and not, you can. Know, and not know it. That's right. That's true. So when a person is going through a situation and he knows that Hashem exists and he's doing it because it's for his best, but there's no action, he's just... Maybe he's still sad. He's, no, he's not sad. Maybe maybe he is sad. Yeah, or he's angry. Or he's he's angry, but deep inside, he's he like, knows. You know what? It's Russia. So I'll it's tell Russia. you, that's the first step towards getting to the point that it's actually in your heart that you experience it. Say it again. I'll give, I'll give you an example. Many people, when they start to come to these classes, 
they get this thing built into their head over and over again. Everything is from Hashem. Everything is from Hashem. Everything is from Hashem. What happens to that person? Now he goes back to his life and he knows that in his mind, but he doesn't know that in his heart. Yes. That means he so, has no emotional feeling. Yes, he doesn't emotionally feel what he knows in his mind. And that actually hurts a lot as well, in a different way. Meaning before, I just thought this was all nature, this was this person placed in things, that's also very painful. Now all of a sudden, Rabbi Nachman is teaching us, actually it's all Hashem. You're good. Okay, great. So now I have my wife, she's rebuking me. She's saying, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, X, Y, and Z. And in truth, it's really Hashem. So at the time, though, I'm being mamish nullified, and it's very painful. But I know when she leaves, and I have a moment to myself, this is from Hashem, this is from Hashem, right? Rabbi Nachman is trying to get you to the point that you don't even have to do that. That literally, it doesn't bother you at all. Why? Because... <laughs> Because, <laughs> yes, okay, but what I'm trying to explain to you is I have like, for instance, I have a student who literally I saw for like ever since I've known him, he has such a rutzon to be close to Hashem, he wants to be so close to him, he became Balchuva, he went to a Litvak Yeshiva, and he just like never found his, he told me there's one rabbi that he really connects to, the Pia Zezna Rabbi, right? Who's that? Who's that? That he was a... He was, Kalanimus Kalman Shapiro. Kalanimus Kalman Shapiro. Kalanimus Kalman Kalanimus. Okay, he's the one who wrote the whole book on um, teaching. That that. Yes, the student's obligation, which is like everywhere. You'll you'll see it. You'll know the book. Okay. He was he was in the Holocaust, and he has there's a there's a book that came. He was he's literally like one of the most legendary Jewish figures in history. No. Okay. Okay, okay. No, I'm saying you know him. You've seen this book. You just didn't even know it was him. Yeah, I saw it at Eichlis. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it at Okay, good. So listen, 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 listen. So, but there's not most of his, first of all, he passed away when he was young in the camps. So there's not many of his writings. And the ones that we have are mostly in Hebrew. So there's a little bit in English. There's one very famous one, and the rest is not so much. And he's trying tooth and nail to try and just read these things and learn these things, but he's not living with it because he can't because it's not translated in English for him and because you don't have a whole expansive uh, category of things that he teaches about everything. So I told him, I said, listen to me. I see how much you want to be close to Hashem. I see how really, really you want. And you just want clarity. You just want a path that allows you to get there. So I'm telling you right now, there is a, an ability to do that. I know one like that. But for you to do that, you're going to have to take a long, short road. You're going to have to do things you never did before. You're going to have to work on things you never worked on before. You're going to have to practice things that you never thought of practicing. And I want you to give it six months. I want you to give it from Hanukkah to Rosh Hashanah. And in, in the time of Hanukkah, he, I started talking about he quoted dude, doing talking to Hashem for an hour. He said, should I do a little bit and then build up? And even though most rabbis said, do that. I don't hold that that's the best way. I think while you're on fire, you should go do an hour so you can taste it. Then you know you can do it. And then you'll have the confidence that even when you fall from it, you know you did an hour. Many people, they do 15 minutes for seven years before they figure out how to do more. 15 minutes, a half an hour, and it takes them 10 years, five years. I understand that, but I'm just trying to explain because a person doesn't think, how could I talk to Shem for an hour? I'm gonna talk to Shem for an hour about this in the beginning, okay? So he literally did an hour every single night of Hanukkah. Every day of Hanukkah, he did an hour. And he thanks me all the time that you made me do an hour in the beginning, because like that really was a big thing for me that I knew I could do it. He said, otherwise I would have been stuck for a very long time trying to do it, okay? But what happened? He texted me soon man a month ago, and he said, David, is it, n n is it like, right now I'm knowing that it's everything is from Hashem, 
but I'm still reacting the same exact way. Is it, er is it, is it ever part of the cards that like, you get to the point that you actually experience what you know in your head? I said yes. And the stage that you're talking about is actually a big step up from the majority of the world. The fact that you even know that everything is from Hashem, even the majority of the religious world doesn't even cop that. How do you get the knowledge to the heart? That's you have to learn this whole Torah. Huh? You have to learn this whole Torah. And you can't cut to the chase because we're taking a long short road. <laughs> so if the person doesn't respond, if his wife does rebuke him, and he says into his mind that everything's from my I'm not that's a, That is a very high level, but that's not the goal. So the goal is not to even feel it. Yes. So one is mind. And then there's, you know, but you don't respond. And then there is, what well, you know, what there's you many hear. levels. And the ultimate level is what's in your mind is in your, in heart, your heart. And then you actually don't feel anything in your heart. But the way to get there is to actually start by knowing and not responding just because you know and feeling that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Stages. But it is impossible for a person in their lifetime to experience that Hashem is one and His name is one. That the good in his life is from Hashem and the bad in his life is from Hashem. Unless he lifts up the Malchut of Kedusha, he lifts up the concept of influence or authority from his preconceived notions that nature and the non-Jewish governments are in control of my life. That people, places, and things are the cause of my life. There is no way, Rabbi Nachman says, for a person to experience that everything Hashem does is for his very best while he still believes that people, places, and things are in control of his life. Because right now, who has the malchut? Where is the government? Where is the whole world living with? Is anybody living with a government according to the Torah? No, it's in exile. Where is everyone living? Under the authority and government of non-Jewish, non-reality-based, human-created government authority practices from ideas that people had. And as long as we are still under that authority, there is no way for you to experience that Hashem loves you and everything He does is good for you. And this is the reason why the Chazal, the rabbis, the sages, Siddiquim said, what is it called when non-Jews worship things? They invest in things that are not rooted in reality. It's called Avodat Alilim. Rabbi Nachman says, it comes from the root word Elohim. Meaning, who is the non-Jewish world believing in? They believe in Elohim. Because they are receiving all of their life force from the revelation of Shem that's called Elohim, which is actually the greatest concealment of Hashem in the world. It looks like judgment, but it's really Hashem just hiding His face. Like it says in the Basuk, Elohim Malkimi Kedem. Hashem is my king from long ago. Meaning now he's not our king. He was at some point our king. But who is our king now? Capitalism, fascism, socialism. Rastafarianism? Rastafarianism. Rastaman. Every single type of human created government based on some very intelligent person's idea of what is going to bring peace to the world 
Where are all of these forms of authority getting their life force from? Not just the people, the actual government. The government is getting its life force from Elohim. Elohim is the revelation of Hashem concealing himself completely. Hiding himself. Why is it that when we live in those countries, everyone has such a hard time feeling that Hashem controls the world and loves them? Because they're living in a government that's governed by Elohim, and they believe in that government. But when we're able to elevate malchut, government, authority, up from these human-made false concepts of government, then the pasuk, that the melech of the whole world, that the orchestrator of reality is, was, and will be Hashem. So right now we have an equation. You have an ability to taste Olma Ba and Olma Zeh. That you literally experience physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. That every good thing that happens to you and every so-called bad thing that happens to you is equally good and from Hashem. Not that you have to convince yourself, not that you have to pound it into your brain, but that you literally experience it exactly the same way because that's exactly what Olam is going to be like. You can do that. However, Rabbi Nachman says it's impossible as long as the concept of malchut, government, authority, influence, is with false ideologies. Yeah, but we live in exile. What are we going to do? We live, what do you mean? You lived in Ukraine. Rabbi Nachman lived in Ukraine. We live in the United States of America. What are you going to do? Mashiach's not here yet. We're not going to have a Jewish government until Mashiach comes. So what are we going to do? The answer is you yourself are a microcosm of the whole world. That means that you have your own sense of non-Jewish government which is residing over you. What is that called? When you are invested in people, places, and things. When you think that I need a certain job in order to make a certain amount of money, that I need to go pitch it to this boss, I need it for this to happen, I need to go to this event to go get with this girl, and I need to have this thing happen to me in order to do this. What is all of that? It's based on shtuyot. Who said you have to plan it? Well, a person has a business idea. They just say he wants to plan it out. Okay, so you you simply like this. First of all, we're not the question. Right? We'll go sorry, the question. No, sorry. no, it's okay, it's okay. I know. It's beautiful. The whole thing is amazing. The whole thing is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So the show. It's not. We'll talk about. It. It's not everything, something that everyone would appreciate because they're not in. They, they don't know the detail. Okay, so, okay, <laughs> so, I'm not saying anything, Rabbi Nachman is saying, yeah, while he's here, yeah, yeah, Mamash, he's in exile, and he experiences all the worst types of suffering, yeah. So you missed last night's class. You got to go back and watch last night's class. I would love to tell you more, but it, it was, I gave a whole hour talk about it. Yeah. Okay. So, very simply, what does it mean on a personal level for me? As long as I have a Muna in anything besides Hashem, it's like the Jewish people being in exile with a non-Jewish government. It's the same thing on a micro level as it is on a macro level. Does everybody understand that concept? If you don't, it's okay. You have to let me know. Because we can't, we can't move forward if you don't understand. You're not going to understand the rest of the Torah. Again, when you think that something needs to be a certain way, you need to have a certain job, you need to be connected to a certain group of people. You need to look a certain way. You need to act a certain way. You need to do a certain thing that the world tells you you have to do in order for you to function. That's called being in exile. Yes. 
That's called investing in false gods. Who taught you that? The non-Jewish world. So who says they know what they're talking about? When did they teach us that? Every moment of your life that you think to yourself that something has to be a certain way for something to happen, what is this based on? It's based on investment in a reality taught to you by the secular world that you control your fate, that you are the cause of everything that takes place in your life. This is what we did in the Kutah and it's going to confuse them. So I, so I just want, uh, uh, again, I just want to say simply, when you are invested in the reality that's, that in people, places, and things, my relationship with my wife can't get better unless I figure out to do something I've never been able to figure out what to do, that I can't make money unless I go and do a certain job and I go to school for 10 years and I get this degree and that degree and I meet a certain group of people, that I can't... Um, Circumstances yeah. and means. Yes. Uh, ways. Yes. All of these... Yeah. Close to, close to Wilbos. He says that. Yeah. He calls Wilbos. He says that a person can't have the suffering if they think that their heart is attached to a certain means of... Uh, Boom. You got it. That's called the Vodazar according to Rabbi Nachman. And even though it's not a Vodazar in the sense that you get judged like it's a Vodazar, the essence of it is exactly the same thing. You're believing in something that something controls your fate besides Hashem. If you like, have a mind that's more like, sort of open, that is why Hashem will give you things from many different directions. He can right? get to it any way he wants. But it will only happen to you if you're ready for it to happen, right? Yes. If you believe that it can only happen through a certain way, you're stopping yourself from getting... That's what we're learning. Right. That's okay. exactly what we're learning. You got it. So the Prasad is going to come. Hashem, I don't know how you going to bring it, but I need it. Beautiful. That's it. Yeah. Done. So you have to sit, but... Again, wait. That doesn't mean that you now, you sit home and you eat potato chips. It's also going to grow. We have to talk about it. Look, every single Torah talks about a different facet of this reality. This reality we're going to be speaking about in every single Torah. Now, how does it look like in business? How does it look like at home? How does it look like here? We're going to have to discuss all those different things. It's a long, short road. <coughs> so you just have to wait and see. We have a long way. We have, we have a long way, but it's, it, it could actually be a very short way. <laughs> There's no trap. <laughs> there <you go. laughs> this is called witty puns. Okay. Let's do a little bit more. I know we're past time, but this is just so geschmack. And just uh, try to stay with me. The E of Shar. And it's impossible. It is impossible to bring the malchut of Hashem out of exile, meaning Yemot Mashiach, that the King Mashiach is going to reign. And what does that mean? That Hashem is going to reign. What do you mean he didn't reign before? He did reign before, but he was hiding himself. When is it going to be out in the open and nobody's going to think that the person who's running the world is a guy with a tan and a toupee? I wonder who he's talking about. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Only when the Dewey Devarim Lifnei Tamil Chacham, when the Jewish people do tshuva. What type of tshuva? So we're saying that this has to do with the personal level. We're worried about the personal. We're worried about the collective. But Lamasa, for yourself. What does this mean for me right now? What do I do with this from this class? Okay, so the government and all of this, what am I going to do about all that? So I'm explaining that Rabbi Nachman saying, you have this whole world in yourself. So you can also reveal that Hashem is the orchestrator of everything in your life, in your individual personal life. How do you do that? He says it's impossible except by doing the Dewey Devarim in front of a Tamir Chacham. What is Vidui Devarim? It means you speak out all of the errors that you've had, not just in terms of what I've done physically, but even in terms of my perceptions of reality. 
my thoughts, my feelings, my actions, all in front of a Tamil Chacham. What's a Tamil Chacham? It doesn't mean someone who is learning all day. Rabbi Nachman is teaching what is a Tamil Chacham? Tamil Chacham literally means a student of a wise person. And it says in a Pasuk, I believe it's in Mishle, but it's in Shlomo Melech, I have to look it up, that Chochmah comes from Ayin. Chochmah comes from nothingness. Wisdom. Ayin? Ayin. Wisdom comes from nothing. So what does it mean? So on a Kabbalistic level, it means that Chochmah comes from Keter. Because Keter is the concept of nothingness. There's no limitations there. There's no physical reality there. Hashem can do anything at the place of Keter. But at that level, we can't experience Him because it's too intense. You would be melted away. What's the beginning of a Jew being able to experience Hashem in his life? No, Chochmah. Chochmah is the beginning of the revelation of Hashem. Because at the level of Keter, you become nullified. There's no you anymore. So Chochmah is the beginning. But where is Chochmah? Meaning, where does the inner reality that Hashem is the one who's doing everything, where is that coming from? It's coming from Keter. It's coming from nothingness. <laughs> okay? This is what Shlomo Melch says, the smartest man who ever lived. That Chochmah, I forget the exact Lashon, it comes from... There, exactly. Say, say, it? say it louder. Say it louder so everyone can hear you. And the, the, the camera also. Chochmah ma'ayin timatzei. Chochmah ma'ayin from nothingness timatzei is found. It where it comes from. It comes from nothingness. What's in the Quran? Shlomo Melech. No, what's the sacred? It's Mishlei or it's a. Uh... I'll tell you right now. One second. One second. One second. One second. One second. Right, but the way that they explain it out is that it, yeah, right, yeah, okay, okay, we'll look it up after. I know it's here. Top right. Mm. Oh, right, it's later on in the Torah. That's right. Okay, one sec. Yes, 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 yes. No, good, good, good. They're good. They did good. The Pasuk says, Hashem, please help me to find this. Here we go. We're getting closer. We're getting so close. Oh! Chavachuch memaayin timatzeh. Oh! Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's not from uh, Shalom Melech. It's Eov. Okay. So Chochma comes from nothingness. Yeah. That's what it says here. It means being humble? Interesting. What? Nothingness means being humble? Nothingness in Kabbalah is, is a code word for Keter. Yo, what? What's Yo, what? Bless you. Yo. Yo, 2812. Okay. What, what's Keter? What's Keter? Keter is... What, sphero, yeah, in the... Top one, right? It's the highest sphere. It's the one that they don't even usually speak about because it's no thingness. And how are you going to describe something that's not a thing? You become nothing. Wait, you want to Keter? Keter? Is that Chochmah is born from Keter. That Keter gi- Because Keter... <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so we need to understand these things anyway moving forward. Okay, we have the 10th wrote. Usually, according to the system of the Ramak, who is, the, who is really the first one to expound Kabbalah in a way that's understandable, right? He was the teacher of the Arizal. Yeah, Ramos Kuber. Yeah. Oh, sorry, he was right before. He, he was right before, and then the result came to his... Yes, okay, so one second. 
So he speaks about Keter Chochma Bina, Chesed Gevur, Tiferet Netzach Chod Yesod Malchut, because this is the basic system of the Ten Sefirot in Kabbalah. However, and after the Arizal, or with, with the Arizal, he started to focus more on Da'at and less on Keter, meaning there are, even though there's only 10 Svirot and Keter is the highest, because Keter is so high, it's so close to Hashem, it's Kiv Yachol like Hashem Himself, so to speak, that we can't even begin to describe it. But where is Keter in a way that we can experience? It's a sphere called Da'at. Da'at is the revelation of Keter. Okay? So what does Ket, why do they say we can't talk about Keter? We don't, why are we not focusing on it? Why is all of the Torah that's based on Chasidut focused Chochmah Bina Da'at? The answer is because Chasidut is busy with how to experience all of these secrets. So why are we going to be busy with something that's above understanding? So that's why the Rotson is Keter? Yes. Because the is only on the Yes. Because it doesn't make sense that because you want something, you can do anything, even though everything in nature tells you that's not the case. So Rotson is higher than that whole thing, then? Yes. It's crazy. Yes. Rotson is higher than? Anything. Even higher than the actual thing that you want? Yeah, that's why Rabbi Nachman says, the wanting itself, you don't even understand the fact that you want something that's good, what this does in all the spiritual world. It's so hard, right? Yeah. Can you control your wants, though? Yeah. Meaning, if you're Rotsanot? Yeah. You can still build those things. Yeah. You say, Shem Hashem, I want what you want. So if a person says, I want what you want, what's the point of praying for? <laughs> we have to deal with each thing in its time. These are all good questions. You're asking amazing questions. They're going to have to be... What's also about how your body is the highest point? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you just like a quick story, and then and then we'll have to we'll have to continue on uh, Thursday night. Okay. Listen, everybody, listen, everybody, listen. Yes, we're gonna do a kumsitz. Yes, I'm gonna explain. Just one second. Let me just t tell you a quick story. Okay. Rabbi Nachman, first of all. Rav Natan said to Rav, Na Rav Nachman, there's a question that Jewish sages, that the Jewish people, that the whole world has had since, since, since time immemorial. Since yesteryear. Since yesteryear. <laughs> Years of yore. How does free will work? There are so many books written about this. There's mamish theses on this. There's philosophies written about it. There is probably cults all just trying to give their own Rabbi Nachman says I have the answer for you <laughs> with this you will know what free will is you never have to think about it again and anyone who asks you could tell them this is what it is and you, you don't have to think anymore this is, this is what it is free will means wait wait <laughs> right on time what are you doing <laughs> Uh, this is like his lifelong <laughs> yeah. Free will means you do what you want to do, you don't do what you don't want to do. This is how free will works. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean I do what I want to do and I don't do what I don't want to do? But I have limitations. But, 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 but things are, what do you mean I can... I can quit smoking cigarettes, but I'm addicted. What do you mean? I can stop drinking alcohol, but I have a substance abuse problem. What do you mean? I can overcome bipolar disorder, but they told me this is a lifelong disease. What do you mean? I can uh, get married and have a good relationship with my wife, even though I was abused when I was a kid. That's not according to nature. And Rabbi Nachman comes along and he says, you want to know how this works? If you want to, you will. And if you don't want to, you won't. That's how free will works. Why is it that people go to Uman, addicted to substances, involved in the greatest darkness, and they can come out of Uman quitting everything that they did for 40, 50, 60 years? Because you do what you want to do, you don't do what you don't want to do, and that's how free will works. 
There's a lot of reasons for it. Um, Whatever, in English, he wanted to do it, right? Yeah. Why is it that he, like, he has, like, he really, really wants to do something, and someone else's free will makes him really, really want to do something, and completely different things, and he just completely doesn't care about what the other guy really wants, and vice versa? So Rabbi Nachman explains in the first Torah of Likud to Moran that a person can't even experience what he really wants until he purifies his heart. What? that as long as a person's heart is not, has not released itself of all lies that it's connected to and attached to, he can't know what he wants because he only wants what his ego wants. Meaning he could have a sense of it, but it's very fleeting because his taivas are so strong. Why is Taiva so strong? Because he's so invested in his physicality and his ego. So Rabbi Nachman says that through the learning of Chassidut, you can quiet your body. And when you quiet your body, you can hear what you really want. Why does Rabbi Nachman say it's good for every single person to talk to Hashem for one hour a day out in nature? Because you have an opportunity at the highest level to quiet down the noise outside and inside. And now you can find out what you really want. Does this apply to everybody in Mount? Everybody. Even women? Even women, even non-Jews. Everybody. Can you repeat that again? So if you want to do what you want to do? <laughs> do Rabbi Nachman says that you do what you want to do, you don't do what you don't want to do, that's how free will works. So what are you going to say? Oh, so if you did it, that means it was because you wanted to do it. Yeah, that's right. And if you didn't do it, it's because you didn't want it. <laughs> no, it's like, dude, did you, did you, hold on, wait, did you do your homework? <laughs> no, no, you didn't want to do your homework, so that's it. He's going to say, I wanted to. So Rabbi Nachman's going to say, no, you didn't. He's going to be, what do you mean? I did want to. I, I, I literally thought all day about doing it. I figured out well, ways to do it. Right. Yeah. But, 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 but because you didn't you do it, I know, I, to, you I, I, I know something. You, so you, couldn't it be sometimes situation gets in the way? Sometimes so, so, so Rabbi Nachman is trying to teach you that the whole concept of circumstances are just to increase your will. Like for instance, a person can say, how am I going to get to Queens from Brooklyn at night for a class and I have to take multiple trains and I have to walk and I have to do this oh, and that. No, wait, 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 wait. No, sir, Rabbi Nachman says nothing's impossible. Okay. Because the Torah says nothing's impossible. Who says something's impossible? Why is something impossible? Who taught you that? It's over my head. No, it's not over your head. Who, who taught you? I want, I'm, I'm, I, this is a real class. This is, we're just friends talking. Who taught you something's not possible? I want you to think oh, of Oh, I know. The Goetian world. That's right. And if a Jewish person also told you something's not possible, you know what Rabbi Nachman says? What he's talking about. It's because he learned it from the Goyish world. If a Chazor Shalom person was born, if he has def defects mentally, physically, emotionally, how is it all of a sudden the person's going to be like, hey, now, it's better now? It's, it's possible, but. It's just like, it's a, it, it, it doesn't happen, a miracle, where the person all of a sudden just... Yeah, it's a miracle. Don't you see a lot of motivational, there's a guy, motivational speaker, he's an athlete, he has no arms, and no legs, and with one arm, like, small like that, he's got... <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, he's known all over the world, he surfs, he bungee jumps, he plays basketball, all the way down all the way down. Listen, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. He's not one, there's many of them. I want to tell you something. It's so important. You need to know this. I came to my rabbi at, at, in my late 20s. And I told him, I've never learned Gemara before. 
I've never learned halacha before. I've never learned Mishnah before. I've never learned Chumash before. I don't know Hebrew. I don't know Aramaic. I don't know Yiddish. I don't know anything. Can I become a rabbi? He took my hand and he said, David, do you want to? I said, yes. He said, okay, so you can do it. What about obstacles? Rabbi Nachman says the whole point of obstacles is just to increase your will. What happens when a person has a difficulty? Like let's say for instance, today, I didn't have a ride to get to learn in yeshiva, but I had a rutzon to be in yeshiva, to go learn in Ben Azman, in the time when everybody's off. So what did I do? I walked an hour from my house to the yeshiva to go learn. People see me sweating through five, seven, ten layers of religious clothing. <laughs> Why didn't you just stay home? Because I wanted to learn. And I wanted to learn more than I wanted anything else. It's that simple. So why is Hashem making it that I didn't get a ride? To increase my will for learning. Why? Because then the learning is more gishmak. Because then the learning is even sweeter. Why is it that it's so hard to get married? Because Hashem is increasing your will. Why is it so hard to get to Uman for Rosh Hashanah? Because Hashem is increasing your will. Why are there the biggest obstacles for the things that I need the most? Because Hashem is just increasing your will. What happens to a person who doesn't know that? He just quits. And there's nothing wrong with him. He's right. How could I do this if I have this issue and I have that issue and I have this disability and I have this disability and I have this practical issue and I come from this sociological status and I come from this economic status? And they're right. Unless you believe in Hashem. And then you realize that no matter what the limitations, no matter what the difficulties, no matter what the stigma, no matter what the trials and tribulations, comes along the great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov and teaches you, you want to know how it really works? Yes. If you don't really want, no, you can't do those things. But if you want it more than the obstacles, then you can do anything. You've been trying to get something for a long time. Um, is the reason that you haven't gotten it because you haven't you're not you don't want it badly enough yet? That's what Rabbi Nachman says. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And so so when, when you get to that point when you want it so bad, he says you're going to have it instantaneously. Right. You'll get it like like you want it like you want to breathe. That's how bad you want it. He says when it, it right. he says when it's like that, you don't even have to wait a second. At the moment it's like that, you're going to have it immediately. This is what he says. He says that the moment that a purse, a Jew's rutzon, is equal to the thing that he wants, the greatness of the thing that he wants, he will get it instantaneously. The whole reason for the obstacles is just to increase your will for that thing. What would happen to me if I never learned these things? I'm going to walk an hour in 100 degree weather to go learn? No, because that's not practical. I'm going to go try and become a rabbi even though I don't know Olive Bet? No, because that's not practical. I'm going to leave my job as a social worker, as a mental health therapist, while I already have a wife and kids. That's not practical. No question. Wait, I want to tell you something. But Rebbe Nachman taught me, so what? So what? It's not practical, and therefore what? So now Hashem can't do this for you? Because this is not practical? According to who? The non-Jewish world teaches it's not practical. And therefore what? They teach when there's a world, there's a way. Is it the same thing? Yeah. But it's very deep. They don't believe it. It's very deep how, how that statement, what that statement means. 
to the extent that Rabbi Nachman is saying, if you really reach the level of wanting something, as great as the thing is, he says you will get it instantaneously. And if you don't have it yet, it's because your want for that thing is not as great as the thing that you want. It's more powerful than that, though. I mean, if you're in the third grade, you don't get it, that way. you don't want it that badly. It does, you don't want it as great as the thing that it is. It doesn't mean you don't want it really bad. It doesn't mean you don't want it more than anything else in your life. It doesn't mean that you don't want it more than anybody in the world wants anything. But it doesn't mean that it does mean that your want for that thing is not as great as the thing itself. How do you know when the <clears throat> Hashem is telling you it's not this way or it's not? It's a great question. It's not there. It's a great question. Only through Hippodid. Only by talking to Hashem every day and talking to Hashem about it. <laughs> and in the end, you want know, to know the real answer? Because you like it like that? Because of the chase. There's no such thing as it's just not there. The Rebbe Nachman is teaching that doesn't actually exist. That if it appears that way, and everything in your life is showing you that because that's what it appears like. However, if you understand that everything is from Hashem, not just in your mind, not just in your heart, but in your fingertips, in your limbs, then you can't say something can't happen because you're really saying that Hashem can't do something for me. And that's absurd. So let's say, for example, let's say I'm married and I want to live in the land of Israel. My wife doesn't want to live in the land of Israel. She has no interest. She's never had interest. She's not even keeping halacha. She's telling me we're never leaving here. I'm happy here, X, Y, and Z. So on paper, what does that mean? It's a tzav. It's a tzav. What am I going to do? I'm going to, I should give it up because this is not realistic. This is not practical. What does Rabbi Nachman say you should do? You should pray and cry to Hashem every single day for at least an hour for what you believe is good. And then one day, if you want it bad enough, your wife is going to say, I want to move to Israel. Now, if you want something that's not good, that's a different thing. Then Hashem just doesn't want to give it to you because it's not good for you. It's not going to do something that's not good for you. But if you want something the Torah says is good for you and you just simply can't in any way access it, like it's not even practical in any way, but the Torah says this is a good thing, this would be good if you could, then Rabbi Nachman says it's impossible that no matter what the circumstances, you can't have that thing. Or that Hashem doesn't want to give you that thing. And if Hashem is not showing you any signs that how you can get it, it's only to increase your will for that thing. And where do you express your will? In your prayer. Well, if you know that thing is great, you don't have a desire for it. Then you need to ask Hashem to want to want. You understand? I have this as well. When I, when I started to become a, uh, uh, learning the teachings of Torah and Chassidut, initially when I saw the word Yira, my back turned like, tightened up. Fear? Oh my gosh, I've had anxiety, I have an anxiety disorder. I don't want to fear anything. I, I want to get away from fear. I have to fear Hashem? Oh my gosh. I want to love Hashem. Let me work on that first, you know? I, don't need, I never even believed in Hashem my whole life. Let me try and love Hashem, yeah? But when I realize that Rabbi Nachman is teaching that Yira is, is not just uh, important because the Torah says, but it is the highest level, it's even higher than love. Yira Romamut, I don't know if I'm saying it right. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's even higher than all. It's called the Muna Shlema. Okay, I'm just telling you this. Yeah. That there's a level of Yira that's called Keter. Okay? It's called complete Amuna, Amuna Pashuta. That literally you have the, the, the highest level of Amuna. It's called Yira. So, I want that, but I don't want to fear Hashem, because I don't want to fear anything. I want to get over my anxiety. So what I say to Hashem, I hebo to do it. 
Hashem, I want to want to have Yira. Because if I say I want to have Yira, I'm lying. I don't want. I don't want fear anymore. I want to not have anxiety anymore. But if I don't pray for it, it means I'm not praying for something that Rabbeinu is saying is really good for you, that the Torah is saying is really good for you. So what do I do that's real for me and real for the Torah and real for Hashem? I say I want to want to have Yira at Hashem. And eventually as time went on, that want to want to have Yira turned into a want to have Yira. And then as that time went on, want turned into having Yira. <laughs> now, yeah. No, I'm serious. And then that want eventually turned into having Yira at Hashem. And now, but that's not done. Now there's higher levels of Yira. And then there's higher levels of Yira. So if you don't want something that you know is good for you, then you pray to want to want that. You have a question or a statement? One second, let me just get questions. Uh, uh, yeah. you, know, you, you just said a second ago that uh, you express what you want in your prayer. Yes. Um, does it go the other way also, that the more you pray, the more you're going to want it? That's right. Okay. Rabbi Nachman teaches that the word for desire and the word for silver is related and connected. It's a whole Torah, but pretty much your wants are, are verbalized and expressed and actualized through your speech. So the more that you pray for it, the more you want it. The more you want it, the more you pray for it. And back and back and forth. So one of the main goals of Hippodidu, which is a secret goal, is to increase your want for good things in your life. Because when you're busy with people, places, and things, when you're busy with work, when you're busy in the secular world trying to support your family, when you're busy trying to go to school and trying to like, do all the basic stuff, it's very hard to grow a will for something that's really good that the world's not doing. So when do I cultivate that part of myself? When do I grow and, 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 and cause to flower and to blossom and to bloom a really holy will? You can only do it by taking time out of your day to talk to Hashem, away from all of these things. So, the word Saron means trouble. Never means exactly the same letter as the word Ratzon, That's right. which is yearning and wanting. And then the word Mitzah, which means created, is also exactly the same thing. So you have a will, you have the narrowness, you have something that says you need to have more will, and then you need to create. What was the first word you said? Was it, was it mean? Saron, Tzara. Like the word Tzara means trouble, and it's also narrowness. So you know, Tzaron. You know. Oh, so you know there's also it's a channel. It's a channel. It's a channel. So I want to tell you how sweet that Chiddush is. Rabbi Nachman says, and it was quoted in a New York newspaper. Wall Street. Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal. The whole world is a very narrow bridge. The main thing, the ikar, is not to be afraid. So what is Rabbi Nachman saying? Everything in your life is a narrowness, is an obstacle that you can turn your Tzaron, your narrowness, into Ratzon, into a will. Everybody have a very good night. Listen, wait, I need to make one announcement. We had a very good idea from one of the founders of Tzion, Bresla Project, that we should really do a... Uh... Is this a sit dance session? <laughs> what is it called again? A kumzitz. A kumzitz or a, a farbrengen. A tish. This is something I've actually wanted to do for years, even before I even started learning with you guys. And I mentioned it to people, and they're like, what are you talking about? This and I never heard of such a thing, okay? However, um, this is one of the most powerful spiritual experiences that a person can have. And... Uh, we made a decision that moving forward, every Thursday night, Bezrat Hashem, we are going to have this experience, this febrengen, this uh, interactive, uh, experiential, spiritual uplifting that is a lot of fun where you are learning the truth of truths and you're singing and you're dancing and you're playing music and you're with your brothers and your best friends and 
It's a very, very powerful experience. The Kumsitz. It's going to be here. The first one in Sion history is going to be this Thursday. Yes? For Sion. We are going to have a live musician. We already have, sp I spoke to him to this morning. He was very excited about it. Usually he has a class every Thursday. He goes, it happens to be this Thursday. It might be the only one that I'm not. Yeah? And then he texted me a couple hours ago and said, I'm able to come. So we have a live musician who's going to be playing guitar and singing. <laughs> We're going to have his companion, his Robin, on the, the bongo. What do you use? <laughs> what do the Bukharians call it? We're not going to have the camera on? Yeah, let's talk about it. Right. Ah, uh, oh, because of a... Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is going to be cholent. We're going to get Shabbat food. Part of it is having a taste of Shabbat before Shabbat. Okay, so we're going to have food that we're ordering in. It's really... It, and we're going to be saying Divrei Torah, Fire Divrei Torah, Rav Nachman Fegazal, the Nachman Levei Makor Chochma, the flowing brook, the source of God consciousness. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to be Svet so Hashem to be everything. Whatever you bring to the table. If you bring your feet, bring. If you bring the feet to dance, we'll dance. You can dance if you want to. And you don't have to dance if you don't want to. <laughs> But then we're going to bring you into the circle anyway, because that's what Rabbi Nachman says to do. Um, so please tell your friends about it. There's a flyer, apparently. That's something else. So there's a new flyer. Benny's going to send it out after the class. Please send it to everybody that you know. There's no limit. There is one limit. It's guys. It's only guys. Okay? And, uh, and otherwise, you're good to go. So now it's only once a week when you're running this? So for now, once a week. <laughs> it's really long road now. <laughs> but I'm telling you that Kumsitz is part of the process. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just right. trust me. I've been teaching the Kutum Iran for three years, four years, every, almost every single night. I'm telling you that one of the most powerful ways to bring knowledge from your mind to your heart is this experience. If I didn't think that, I wouldn't do it. I'm not doing this for fun. I'm not doing this because I'm making money off of it. I'm literally, every decision I'm making for Tio and for the, my students is what do I think is going to help us go across this long, short road as soon as effectively as possible. So come try it out. Let's we'll see. Same okay. time, right? Anybody have this in the I already prayed. Okay. Let's see. Thank you.